Today we're going to carry on with Acts and we're going to look at the power of God's Word. We're going to celebrate the fact that God's Word is powerful. God's Word has kind of been preserved for 2,000 years and every single revival is a revival of truth as well. The gospel comes to the fore. We begin to understand what the primary purpose of the church is and it's not just to fill a building or to be called by some denominational name. Now, the purpose of the church is to preach this gospel. Let me try and put everything in perspective this morning, kind of as I've been kind of discerning what's been going on over here. Matthew 24, 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So if you want to know when the end is coming, it's not COVID. COVID could be a sign. It's not a kind of corruption of everything, every system in this world. It could be a sign. Yes, the true evidence is God has called us to preach this gospel where? The whole world. I feel like there's a perspective shift that needs to take place in every single one of our hearts. Please do not live just for the comfort of where you stay, and the only kind of challenge you have is trying to make yourself more comfortable or more safe or more secure or more prosperous or anything. This world needs to hear the gospel. And then in the world, every single ethnic group. So if you want to know God's agenda for your life, the whole world, every ethnic group. And so that's how he looks at every single believer because he's saying the end is going to come. But the end's going to come as we challenge the status quo, even if it's in prayer at first. But I do believe we're going to continue to see many, many, many more come standing in the front, be prayed over, and go out. About, I think it's about a year and a half, two years ago, 31 eldership couples. As I look now, within about six months, there will be 20 left. 11 gone. We never fired them. They weren't, none of them have died. None of that. The majority of them have relocated and a lot of them have been called to go to other situations, plant churches and make a difference. And you know why? It's because of this gospel, this incredible gospel. I just thank God for it. This morning as we were singing, somebody said it was like a rock concert. (laughs) Man, I tell you, it was even better than a rock concert. (laughs) Way better. Because we sang to the rock of all ages. (laughs) The one who has changed this world forever. You know what I I was reminded of? We are sojourners. You know what a sojourner is? I don't belong here. And when I sing, I get caught up to a place. And there's this anticipation of, man, I'm meant for something more than this. And for this period of time, I'm kind of enduring these circumstances. But I tell you, when you lose sight of worship and the king, then COVID, and then rolling blackouts, and then (laughs) no water, all of these become like emergencies. I went and bought 12 five liters of water when I saw a little clip in the news. Now my house is full of water. I don't know what to do. (laughs) Any of you need water, come and speak to me. I've got a stack of it at the moment. But it's interesting how when we take our eyes off the prize of the kingdom, we start to live for temporal values. And I want to encourage us. That worship is just a little bit of what God wants us to do always on a daily basis. We're just sojourners. We're passing through with a mission. We've got a mission that we need to get busy with. I felt this morning, just before we get into looking at the Word of God, um, if you look around, have you noticed that some folk have not come back since the whole COVID kind of lockdown and so on? Doesn't it grieve your heart? I've tried with some of them. We've phoned them a few times. We've invited. We've gone and visited. But some guys have just found another groove, another thing. You know, like either it's pajama Christianity or it's nothing. So we stopped our live broadcasts or our live streaming because we need to get together. So, you know, I'm not preaching that to you. You know that you're here. But I thought, could we just for a moment stand? Thank you. And, and let's pray 
for some of those you know that should be here and aren't here, and perhaps there's some like circumstance that is surrounding them that is difficult. I do understand that, so let's pray against that. And, and let's pray for revival in their hearts and name these people to God because I feel like God wants to bring those prodigals back. And maybe others that you know, in some way they've drifted off, out of fellowship, they're not connecting as they should. Can we pray for them as well? And also, if you've got loved ones that you think, man, I just want to trust God for them to be born again. Could you face each other? Like if there's a little group of you, make a little prayer group out of that. And then you start to pray. Name the people to your group. Tell them who you trust in God for. And let's do that. We are trusting God for the prodigals to come back. And we know that God knows exactly the circumstances and we just pray that whatever's holding them back would be reversed. Whatever the circumstances are, if there's a laziness that is crept in, that that would stop. And we claim them for the kingdom right now. We know the prodigal had to get to the pigsty before he came to his senses. And Father, we pray that they would come to their senses right now in the name of Jesus. We exercise faith as we pray. And we call them back in Jesus' name. When those prodigal came back, the Father was there, full of love, to welcome the prodigal back. And so we trust you now for this in Jesus' name. No more excuses. No more laziness. No more lukewarmness, apathy around us. Local church is important. Getting together is important. So we trust you for that now. Reversal in their thinking. In the way they're doing things. And Father, even those who have made commitments before and have drifted, bring them back in Jesus' name. Family members that do not know you, that sometimes perhaps even mock this thing of Christianity, we call them back. We call them into the kingdom. We pray for them. We pray that whatever lie the enemy has given them, that they would be set free now. And in their hearts, it would be an incredible turning back to you, Father. Trust you for that, Lord. And I tell you, we need to be saying a lot of amen. So be it, Lord. That's what amen means. Amen, Lord. Amen for them coming back. Amen for them turning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. You're an awesome king. And maybe in that group as well, I know Greg said pray for the nations. Maybe pick up one or two nations that you want to pray for. Pray for France. We've got a church plant there. Pray for Spain. There's a new foothold in Spain. Pray for Kenya. Pray for Henny and Zelda and team that are there now. Pray for Ethiopia. Pray for Poland. We've got a couple that one day are going to relocate to Poland. Uh, let's trust God for that. Pray for Ukraine. Pray for Russia. More church plants, Father. Southeast Asia. See, as the body of Christ, He enlists us into the army so that we can do warfare. And prayer is the greatest way in which we do warfare. Thank you, Lord. We stand in agreement, trusting you for revival. Thank you, Lord. Awesome. Let's take our seats, please. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12 and verse 24. We're going to look at the power of God's Word. Um, at times we've read a whole chapter, maybe 30, 40 verses. We're reading one verse today. <laughs> but in that verse is a pattern that we see in the book of Acts. And if we understand Jesus' heart about how important the Word of God is. Remember the parable of the sower. The sower, God sows seed, the Word, into our hearts. And as He sows the Word, 
And we know the word, it's not blah, 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 some philosophy. The word is the gospel. The word is forgiveness. The word is redemption. The word is righteousness. The word is kingdom. The word is living with him for eternity. As he sows it, he said he's trusting for a harvest, 30, 60, or 100. So we know initially the word is sown. We hear this gospel. I remember kind of hearing the gospel, walking past uh, the invisible church, but they were quite visible because they were there, uh, on the beachfront in Durban, and they were playing guitars and singing and giving testimony. And I looked at my friend and I said, what a lot of hogwash. All of them are like losers in life. My heart was stony. That was it. There was no ways that testimony that I heard about uh, one of the lifeguards, I used to take acid, and you know, then Jesus came into my heart and I became born again. I thought, yeah, yawn, yawn, yawn. It meant nothing to me. Stony heart. And about fast forward another 10, 10 years, and there I was at the front of a little kind of church, you know, like repenting and saying, thank you, God, for this gift of salvation. What was the difference? Same word, it was the condition of the heart. And so, you know, initially we received this word, and I do believe that there are some here today, you need to be born again. As I prayed for this morning, I felt that today's a day of reckoning for some. And maybe it's not just in the issue of being born again, but remember there was a guy in the Bible who had this big harvest, and he said, cool, I'm going to build more barns, and then I'm going to sit back and sip my pina coladas and watch Netflix and just enjoy the good life. I'm rich. And then it said, that night, excuse, what is happening here? Where did he come from? <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, you know, us white people think all angels are white. <coughs> So there you go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's blow some of your theories. Good. White, blonde, you know, that blue eyes, that is pathetic, really it is. Where were we? <laughs> this old guy, this rich guy lying on his lounger, just enjoying life, and his life was kind of, he had to give an account. There was a reckoning that night. And you know what? In all of his kind of planning, and, and with great excitement, I know we plan. You know, none of us are sitting there and saying, gee, we just hope we fail. No, we plan to succeed. We want to have a good house. We want to have good things, etc., etc. But he left God out, and we cannot afford to leave God out. Do not leave God out, because that is the only important priority that any of us are ever going to have. And when you do get to the pearly gates and Peter's there with the ledger, he's not going to ask you about bank balances. He's not going to ask you about how cool your company was or how many good things you have or, you know, what kind of sport achievements. It's do you have a relationship with Jesus or not? And that is the important thing for everyone. Do not even from, so from that starting point and onwards, keep reckoning Christ first, kingdom of God first. That's what we're going to see with the word of God, because the word is the will of God. The word is the purpose of God. The word is the power of God. The word is the freedom to this world. This is what he's offering through Christ. Christ became the living word. He, he was the embodiment of truth, and he arrived with a message to give. And that's why in your reckoning, in your planning, in your looking forward, in your trying to understand life, do not leave God out of the picture because it'll always be to our detriment. We'll always kind of find ourselves, you know, hamstrung, looking for a way to recover. You see, Christianity is not a little bit of Christianity and, you know, me and my thing. It's kingdom only. The king is on the throne and we serve him. Very important that. So from that first moment, I made that decision. It was like, now I'm starting to see the fruit of God come into my life. And so on an ongoing way, the Bible tells us, with fear and trembling, work out your salvation. You know, you know what that fear and trembling tells me? It's not a trivial matter. Once I've been born again, it's not a trivial matter to continue as a believer. 
I don't tick Christianity off and eternal life off and then just pitch at a church meeting every now and again. No, I need to engage in my relationship with God and allow His Word to continue to produce life. Do you remember the, th- the four types of seed that, or uh, four types of heart condition? The first one was the path, and it said the birds of the air came and stole it. In other words, it hadn't even germinated the seed. There was no understanding. And often that's what happened to me when I walked past this invisible church kind of doing an outreach. There was no understanding. I feel we can pray for those that don't know Jesus. God, open their hearts. Open their minds. Give them an understanding so that as the seed is sown, it can start to take root. And you see, the enemy knows the potential of that seed to produce fruit. He knows it. And that's why as soon as it's sown, he's going to come in with the counter-argument. And you know, often that has happened with the truth. As the truth of God has come, you, th- you know, kind of a counter-argument, impossible. You know, the day I got born again, I had a friend of mine who we smoked dope with and did all sorts of stuff. He phoned me up and he said, I suppose you're going to tell me you're born again. And I said, Yes. And he said, don't be an idiot. That stuff's a lie. It's stupid. Immediately, the enemy wanted to steal the seed away. But no, it had started to germinate. The second condition, it's kind of the the heart, it's shallow soil and there's rocks. And and so the the seed can't go down. It, It can't take root properly. So you see, you can't just accept truth. You've got to act on truth, and you've got to understand it. You've got to put it into practice, because that word needs to start to to not only germinate, but to put roots down and a stem up so that it can produce something of a harvest. And you know, that is commitment to the Word of God. That is saying, you know what? There is a way that seems right to me, but the ends thereof, the Bible tells me, are death. And there's always a good plan. There's always my wisdom. There always seems to be some pragmatic solution to life. But you know what? Forgive as God forgave. Then we add our understanding. I know God forgives, but I don't. I'm Clint Eastwood. You know, he's got a famous movie called Unforgiven. And one of his lines is, God forgives and I don't. Bah, dead. And a lot of us are like that. We put reasoning. Do any of you know Clint Eastwood? This younger crowd have no clue. They think he's like some rock star or something. Anyway, God forgives. We can't add our understanding. You can't give me a set of circumstances and say that I can't. Because God forgives every one of us always as we come to him. And so we can't add our own understanding. So the Bible tells me that when that seed is sown, the soil is shallow, immediately persecution and the enemy comes up against me to try and take that truth away. So we've got to stick with it. That's why a lot of guys within their first couple of weeks of being saved are gone. Because somehow the persecution for truth's sake has caused them to slip away. And so we need to continue to allow that word, read it, listen to it, celebrate it, love it. And slowly it'll start to take root. Third condition is now this thing is a truth has produced fruit and the plant is growing. But it says the cares of this world, the pleasures of life, and the deceitfulness of riches are going to compete. And so I want to see the word in my life produce the 30, 60, and 100 fold that God said. But you know what I've got to do? I've got to address those things, the priorities. I've got to address the desires of my heart. Because often... They compete with the Word of God. They compete with the gospel. They take the resources away from the gospel. Now, I don't want to give my best to what I'm about, and then what's ever left over, let's give it to God. Now, I must give the best to Him. I want this gospel, I want my whole life to be sold out to it. And it's not, you know, put fish stickers on my car and praying hands when you walk into the you know, my lounge or whatever it is, and, you know, Bibles everywhere. It's the gospel in my heart is growing, and I'm convinced this is the only way. And those things 
Yes, the, I, I can enjoy life, but they don't rule. They don't dictate. They don't. And then the fourth type of heart. You know what it talks about the fourth? Is they understood the truth and they persisted with it. Persisted. You've got to persist. It's, this is the fight of faith. The fight of faith. I've got to stand against all of that and I've got to trust God for the fruit. And I tell you, there is a freedom for those who forgive that you can't explain. There's a grace for those who give that you can't explain. And these attributes of the gospel, as we kind of persist in them, there's, there's, there's an incredible, for me, anointing on our lives that we just cannot explain. And I want to encourage us with that. So against this kind of backdrop or understanding of how the word should take root, we have this verse in Acts 12, verse 24. So who remembers what Acts 12 was? That's the last preach we had out of the book of Acts. It was persecution, death. It was James being killed by Herod. Remember James? First martyr, he was killed. And then Peter's imprisoned. He's uh, miraculously set free. But remember the 12 gods, they are put to death by Herod. And then Herod gives us great speech, da, 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 you know, and everybody says, he's a God. And I'll, Herod just kind of stood there, of course I'm a God. And it says that instant he was struck down by an angel. And then we have that lovely little descriptive verse, and the worms consumed him. Don't you like that? Then it says, but the word of God increased and multiplied. In other words, whatever Herod represented... You know, his, his, his kind of inhumane attitude in getting those soldiers uh, killed and killing of James and, you know, thinking he's the guy. Whatever he represented, that kingdom of self, that kingdom of evil, that kingdom of, you know, man, it came crashing down. But the word of God, the kingdom of God increased and multiplied. And there are four times, this is a pattern we see in the book of Acts, that that kind of statement is made. Listen to this quote because it'll help us kind of understand what is being said. Matt Smithurst said this, we tend to say the church grew, Acts tend to say the word spread. We talk about church growth, Acts talks about word growth. So here's a challenge, preach the word and let God take care of the size of your church. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing how we forget what the true emphasis is. So when they went around, they weren't preaching a Jerusalem church membership. When they went around to the, the kind of countries and the situations that they went into the disciples, they preached the kingdom, the gospel of God. And so in the book of Acts, we see four times the word of God increases, it multiplies, it gains uh, in impact. And so through looking at those, we can see the kind of focus God wants us to have and see the common challenges to the word, the common ways in which the enemy uh, is going to want to try and take our eyes off the word of God. And so therefore, it helps us understand where our focus should be. So the first time it was mentioned was Acts chapter 6. Who remembers Acts chapter 6? Acts chapter 6 is all about church growth. It says the number of disciples was multiplying. The church was getting bigger. And so there was issues with the widows. Some were getting fed. Some were not getting fed. And so the disciples then, because of their busyness with that, they were ne neglecting the ministry of the Word of God. And so what did they do? They appointed uh, deacons who helped them so that they could focus on ministry of the, of the Word of God and then it says, at the end of that passage of Scripture, it says, And the Word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So it shows a victory that the Word of God had in that set of circumstances. So here's the deal. Let me try and put it in terms that we'd understand. This is how it's happened with me. Kind of you get busy with the work of the ministry or you get busy with Christianity, what goes? 
I haven't got time to read the Bible anymore. You know, I haven't got time to focus on meditating on Scripture. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven kind of thing. And so in our busyness, and sometimes the success of what God gives us in what we call to, we can neglect the basics. You see, what makes us successful is the Word of God. So when we get to a place of success, don't neglect the Word of God. Somebody's going to say, well, I've read the Bible already. That's cool. I'm glad. But we aren't superheroes because we've read the Bible once. How often should we read the Bible? How many times should we have read through the Bible? We don't. We just put three dots at the end. We should be reading every day, and we should be meditating and looking to apply and study and, and love the Word of God. We can never neglect the reading and the ministry of the Word of God in our lives because I want to continue to produce kingdom fruit season by season. I never want to have an empty plot. I want to just see seeds sown into there. And so this comes back to the simple challenge of get back to the Word of God. And you know what? There are many, many other things that could occupy us, but let's get back to the Word of God. We need to have, and don't put this pressure on you, I have to read the Bible in a year. Show me where that is in Scripture. Nowhere. But I need to read the Bible regularly. And so in that, some have read it through in a year. I remember there was a lady that got saved at Cornerstone, and she kind of came up for counsel, and we said to her, I wasn't involved, some of the other elders were, she said, what do I do? We said, read through the book of John. She said, yeah, but more. Okay, well then, read through John and then start at Matthew and then just kind of read through some of the New Testament to get an understanding. So she comes back two weeks later and she says, I'm finished. So she said, okay, well then maybe start with the Old Testament. She said, no, I'm finished the whole Bible. <laughs> you know what that was? That was a sign of our love and I'm, I love Jesus and I'm passionate about Christianity. Boy, fast forward to like perhaps me 20 years down the line. And it's a battle to keep regular with Bible reading. But I want to encourage us, the ministry of the, of the Word of God should never kind of slip to some kind of low priority in our lives. And even if you're a deacon or an elder and you say, well, prep, you know, when I prep, I do it. No, all of us should be fed on the power and the goodness and the grace and the, of, of this gospel, of this Word of God. So that first one, was the priority test. Will the Word of God always be a priority? Okay, second one is the one that we're reading over here. And that is this position of the Word of God. The position of the Word is that it's top priority. Pride is always going to come in as something that distracts us. And so, kind of the two are, are, are put together. We have the pride of Herod, and we have the priority of the Word of God. We have the power of the Word of God. And so, there is no thought, and when you hear a preacher elevate his own opinion above the Word of God, just kindly put up your hand and say, could we rather hear what the Word says? Because that's more important. Good preachers will get behind the exposition of the Word to try and teach the Word because the Word sets free. And you see, there is wisdom in man. There is an understanding. You know, we can do all sorts of things. We've got telescopes up in the sky and we, you know, how to farm fish and I don't know, we know how to do all these complicated things. Excuse me. Make, we can even make iPads. But you know, there's only one truth that sets free and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one truth that is going to bring life. And I, and I tell you, it's important that we stick with the truth of God's Word. And it's important that we don't allow any kind of arrogance to get in the way. You know, I might get an opportunity to preach in front of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And there might be a great anointing and thousands of people have been born again and there's miracles. And it's such a subtle thing to own that glory. You know what? Outside of the anointing of God and the power of His Word, it's just flesh and blood. The big difference is God. It's His Spirit. It's not me. And so it's important that the Word breaks through this pride barrier. Can the Word break through? Can it be that the Word is the strongest opinion 
in your life. The strongest influence, the strongest information on how to live. And is it that when I make, uh, when I chat to people that I'm, I'm hearing more the Word of God come out and less my opinion? You know, at Bryce, I've told my brother and my cousins and my uncles and how this country should run. I've told them how the Eskom should run. I've told them how everything should run. But I tell you, there's more important issues, and that should be on how important it is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The third one is an interesting one, and we call up, termed it the penetration of the Word of God. And so what had happened is for a while the gospel was kept in a culture, a language, and a people, and a religious system, in the Jewish religious system. And, and they couldn't quite conceive the gospel going out. But there comes a time when Paul actually makes a statement that the gospel has been rejected as we've gone into the synagogues, and now the, the uh, Gentiles are accepting it. And it says this, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Verse 49 of chapter 13. And the word of the Lord was spreading through the whole region. Then it says, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So who does the gospel belong to? Where does God want this gospel to go to? The whole world and every ethnic group. And that is challenging. Because we like our ethnic group. Because we eat the same thing, we talk the same way, we laugh at the same stupid jokes, etc. But you know, that doesn't play a part in God's kingdom. I'm glad that you enjoy that. But there's a world. And, and so the penetration of the word, of this gospel, it's got to transcend where we're at. We can't sit here and think it's just about us or just about our kind of group of friends, or our family, or it's just about our city. It's more. This country and the world needs to know. And out of this group, God is going to send more and more and more and more. Because that's what it's about. And so it's a prejudiced, critical, ungodly attitude that says, well, to hell with them. I'm happy, Jack. To hell with them. Who cares? I'm going to heaven. Do you know how inconvenient it is loving somebody from another ethnic group? Do you know how inconvenient it is when I go to Italy and I have to eat their food? Oh, actually, that's not a problem. Sure. <coughs> Sorry, that was a bad one. <laughs> when you have to try and understand their language. And you know how inconvenient it is when you miss your wife's no, it's our anniversary. <laughs> our anniversary, or you miss birthdays and everything. It's amazing how some of us, we build everything, our call and our function of God, all around what we're about. It's not about that. For God so loved the whole world. And the, the thing is, in every one of our lives, we're going to be challenged this way. This gospel's got to go further. It's got to go further. You know, and, and I know this is the most intimidating thing. And Adele and I are like a long-term mission program at the moment with our neighbor. We've got wonderful neighbors, and we're just saying, God, give us an opportunity. We're looking for ways. We look over that wall, and we say, show us ways in which we can love. They're different nationalities, but we want to see them get the gospel. We need to look over the walls of our city, over the walls of our country, into the nations of the world. Last one is an interesting one, and it's the power of the word. Uh, the, the word has to break every other false power's barrier. Because there are many isms. There are many, um, you know, Paul said about those things that are taught that are not the gospel. They are doctrines of demons. You try and state that in a public square and see how quickly you're going to find yourself in jail. That's prejudiced speech. But it's interesting how Scripture is clear. There is only one truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. And so there was that great moment in Ephesus when through the ministry of Paul and, you know, through the seven sons of Sceva being shown up for the 
kind of charlatans that they were, one demon beats up seven because they don't quite understand the whole issue of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and in His name, I cast out demons. In His name, because of the relationship I have with Him, I can pray for the sick. Seven sons of Sceva, what did they say? In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. In other words, magic wand. It's not. It's a relationship. And then, all of the people who practice magic arts brought their scrolls and threw them in probably the town square. 30,000 drachmas worth was that. 82 years of salary for a person. That was an expensive little exercise, and they burnt it. And this is what it says after they did that. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mighty. Isn't that awesome? This is warfare. See, so when we go to Ephesians, we, we see warfare is about the application of God's word. You know, helmet of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, you know, feet shod with the gospel of peace, sword of the spirit, belt of truth. This is warfare. So you can't have the gospel and something else. So the best way is, and I know this is obvious, you can't have the gospel and what star sign are you? Because, you know, I kind of feel lucky, you know? You know, and, and kind of, you want to know, is this an auspicious season for me? You know, you meet a new person, you think this could be the one in the Lord, but what star sign are you? And I know that sounds obvious and stupid, but there are other ways in which we allow other truth to kind of dominate. Other ideas, other ideologies, get rid of them. Because the Word has got to break through this power barrier. There is only one authority, and it's the Word of God. It's the, the only way I'm going to realign my life is on the Word of God, not some philosophy. And I tell you, man can come up with some very, very interesting philosophies, but we've got to let all of those bow their knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So in conclusion, notice the time, 10.30. Talk about, wasn't that good? You all thought this was going to be at 10.45, eh? Biggest clap today is you finished on time. <laughs> so I want to ask you this. This is the challenge to each of us. Is God's Word always our top priority? Next one. Are our hearts submissive and humble before God, giving Him glory every opportunity we have? Third question. These are all based on those scriptures. Are we consumers and spectators, or are we apostolic at heart? Are we outward focused for the sake of the gospel? And then last one, is God's word the final and highest authority and power in our lives or do we place our faith in anything else?